and we're live. Stavros, how the heck are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Oh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for agreeing to be on. And second of all, I want to burnish your ego a little bit because when I decided to do this uh, video chat series, you were thought one or two, I'm not going to tell you which one, on <laughs> having you on because one, you and I have never had a bad conversation. And two, what you do for a living has always fascinated me. So um, uh, I want to thank you again for doing it. And I want to thank everybody who happens to be viewing this video. Welcome to Did You Know That? Question mark. Uh, this is a 30-ish minute conversation about things and people that I find fascinating, interesting, uh, quite possibly annoying, but I just won't let them know that. Uh, Stavros is not one of the annoying people. Um, for all those who might be just joining us, my name is Sean O'Rourke. I'm a cyber liability consultant for an insurance brokerage and consultancy called Combs & Company. And we are headquartered out of New York City. Stavros, why don't you tell the, the fine folks who you are? Sure, sure. Um, I feel a lot of pressure to live up to, uh, to, to, some, to being somewhat interesting now. Um, what I do for a living is interesting. So well, wait, start... what's your full name? Perhaps. My name is Stavros Michalidis. Okay, there we go. Um, and uh, I work with a company called No Innovation, and that's spelled with a K. It works a little bit better if you write it down. And basically what we do is we host workshops for scientists so that they can have scientific breakthroughs. Um, mostly across disciplines, so getting people who don't normally talk to each other to talk to each other. And um, my expertise and what kind of enables me to, to, to do this is not in science itself, although I've always been very interested, I've always been curious about science, it's in human creativity. How do human beings solve problems? How do they do that collaboratively? Um, and, um, and how do they make breakthroughs? And that is the whole reason that you are on, because I've, the, from the moment we met years ago, I, I've always been interested in, can you teach creativity? And you have actually done it both at the corporate and higher education level for years. So can you teach creativity? That's my first question to you. So in fact, when, when I first found out about this, um, I, was, I, I had started a company, um, I wasn't very happy I was looking for a way to, to do something else. I was looking for the next chapter in my life. And I, I was looking actually to do a PhD in leadership because I, I really liked the concept of leadership. I always, um, I always did well in an academic environment. I enjoy learning. So, you know, if you go to a classroom and somebody hands you a really structured way to learn, I, I always really like that. And then I could use that as a foundation to kind of jump off and do, and do my own learning. And so I came across this program called, um, it was a Master's of Science in Creativity and Change Leadership. And I said, creativity, can you teach that? <laughs> right? Can you learn that? You had like, the same I question did. I did. So I called them up, and my first question was probably quite offensive, which was, are you real? <laughs> was actually my, my first question. I like that. And, and apparently they had been around for a really long time, studying creativity and actually doing a 30-year experiment around can you teach creativity. And they had taken a cohort of students and they had trained them in some skills and they had monitored them over the course of their, um, of their life. Um, and they had seen kind of how they did compared to a random control group. So, um, so the short answer is yes. The much more interesting answer is, is what does creativity even mean? And what are we talking about when we say teach creativity and, and, and how, does, how does that happen in real life? Well, that was going to be my next question. So why don't you just run right into that one? So um, a lot of times people associate creativity with art or they yeah. associate creativity with um, engineering uh, or they associate creativity um, with a comedian or they associate creativity with, um, you know, um, about business Anything person, they an entrepreneur. Can't do. Anything yeah, something they, they can't, can't do. do. Yeah. And in fact, if, if, if I think about it really simplistically, Creativity is the ability to see a pattern where there wasn't one before. And, okay. and our brains are really, really good at finding patterns. All of our brains are really good at that because that was a fundamental skill that was required to survive. 
um, mm -hmm. when, you know, in, in evolutionary history. So, so the trick is, if you see the same patterns every day, you're not really going to have the opportunity to come to any new conclusions. Sure. So you have, you have to put yourself in situations or you have to use techniques which force you to take other things that were previously absurd or chaotic and form order out of them in a new way, not in the usual way. And, and those two things are what we try to do when we teach creativity. We try to say either find a way to put yourself in a scenario that you wouldn't have been before so that you can resolve that one or find a way to resolve the same scenario you have been resolving, but resolve it differently. Don't do right. it the same old way. So when we met, you had your business and you were sort of teaching it at a corporate level. You left that, you went, uh, you started teaching in, in a university. Um, and now you're a known innovation and you're sort of doing this in the scientific community. So you've been in three different arenas. Does the teaching methodology change depending on the subjects? Or is it this different depending on the verticals? Or is it the same sort of wherever? I, so it does change, right? Because what people care about changes. And so how you frame the education and how you make it interesting um, and how you make it relevant changes. Um, okay. And the types of techniques that you use and the time frames. So when I was doing corporate training, what I was really trying to do was um, innovation consulting. But there were no budgets back then for innovation consultants. But the word innovation was floating around the HR department and the L&D department. So people I would work, I would talk to at corporations would say, I don't have a budget for an innovation consultant, but we do have a budget for an innovation trainer. Would you come in and do some training? <laughs> so, uh, so that's how we ended up doing corporate training because that's kind of what led us um, to that scenario. And what we heard was really interesting in that space was that people would come to these things and they would go, that was great. These are all skills I could really use, especially in my life, but there's just no room for them here at work. They don't want me to be creative, right? They're telling me they want me to be creative. They're bringing me to this class to teach me how to be more creative, but really, there's so much structure erected around me that I'm basically told to swim in my lane most of the time, you know? Right. I mean? Yep. So, um, and, and for a large part, I would have to say not everywhere, but that's actually true. You know what I mean? A lot of what corporations say when they want innovation, um, is, is lip service, not to say that there aren't people in there trying to make it happen, but for the average person in a corporation trying to say, well, where is this person's opportunity to really be creative? It's pretty limited. Yeah. Uh, and, and I started to find that um, not rewarding. Um, I started to find that kind of saying, well, all right, so I'm teaching people skills which they like and they appreciate, but then they can't go and apply. So um, what we do in the scientific space, which is really interesting, is we run these workshops which aren't about training anybody anything. The learning happens as a result of participating in the workshop, but it's about the outcome. It's about kind of hacking people's brains and creating an experience for them that results in a breakthrough. And, um, and that is far more interesting, yields results, and the people leave those things going, this was fantastic, this, is, this has changed my career, this has, you know what I mean? And so when you get that kind of reaction from users versus right. the previous kind of reaction, it was a no-brainer for me as to where I wanted to put my attention and where I wanted to focus. Well, let's be honest, the scientists, their whole objective is to come up with something new, different, something that moves the needle, takes a step up on the plateau, where when you're talking in a corporate structure, to your point, the boxes are sometimes self-imposed by the corporation, sometimes imposed by outside sources like regulators or shareholders or what have you. Um, so in that end, let's stick with the scientists since that's what you're doing now and you find it uh, much more rewarding. Give us an example of how you operate with them and how everyday people who may be watching this could possibly use that to translate into their everyday lives without going into too much detail because yeah, you do yeah. get paid for this. Yeah, so when I first started this, I, I thought, so um, you, could, you could say what we, we, what we do, you could call it facilitating. You facilitate an event, I think is the, the kind of term people like to use. 
So in the beginning, I used to think about that very much like moderating. You kind of control the dialogue and you kind of, you know, and, and that really felt like I was being more of a bother than a help. I was being a nuisance. I was being a block in the conversation. So that quickly, quickly died. And then it became about, well, I know the milestones people need to reach in order to kind of come to breakthroughs. So what if I watch their, what they're doing, and every time they seem to be going down a rabbit hole that's going to lead them the wrong way, what if I change the process? What if I divert the process a little bit? So that lasted a little longer. Um, and so you could do things, people could do things in their life to, to kind of um, structure processes. Um, I'll give you a couple of very quick examples. If you're stuck and you're in a bind, um, not, not in an urgent sense, but like you just find yourself in this rut and you don't know what to do. Right. Um, most people come up with an idea and then immediately evaluate it and go, that's all the reasons why it's not good. And then they go come up with some other idea and they immediately evaluate it and come up with the other. A very, very simple technique is separate those two. Dedicate time to just coming up with ideas. Consider those options. And isn't it always better to have more options than less? So sure. just set up, set up target and say, I'm going to come up with 12 options for what I might do. And then put them on the side, come up with 12. Don't worry about evaluating at all. When you are done with the 12 options, when you've hit your mark, then you say, okay, now it's time to evaluate these options. And you come up with your criteria and you say, what's important to me? It's important to me that I meet criteria A, B, C, and D. And then you look at each idea and not only do you just try to kill it by going, it doesn't meet criteria B, but you go, it's weak in criteria B. How might I make it stronger? So you take each of your 12 ideas and you try to make them stronger. And in that process, some new idea will emerge, some combination of these, something out of left field, which will kind of be a much stronger outcome than if you had simply said, let me come up with an idea and judge it, and then come up with another one and judge it, right. and come up with another one and judge it. That simple trick of just generate ideas separately, evaluate them separately, and when you evaluate, do it constructively, that's probably 75% of the battle. So look, I'm going to interrupt you there for a quick second. So are we, and I'm saying we as human beings, are we wired to self-sabotage our ideas? Or is it just that evolved out of, out of something else? That's is a that really, natural? Really good question. Or is it, or, yeah, that's or a is really, it something really else? That's a good question. Why do we do this to ourselves? Right. My guess. I mean, I do it. I'll be honest. I do it. I come I up it. with ideas and then I, yeah, I mean, we've talked about that. I've come up with ideas and I immediately said, well, it won't work because of this. Instead of saying it will work because of this. Right. My guess is the reason we don't do it is because it's not efficient and survival is often more about efficiency than it is about novelty. Okay. So, so my, this is kind of evolutionary in your mind. That would be my guess. That would be my guess. And then that, you know, um, evolutionary program is highlighted or, or dampened based on environment, right? That was the last thing I was going to say is when we do these workshops, after you kind of focus on process, the next thing you focus on is climate. Like, what does it feel like to be in the room? What is the atmosphere? And if you okay. have, if you create a certain atmosphere in the room, you actually don't even need to intervene that much in the process because if you have the right atmosphere, people will immediately go into the mindset that's appropriate for that stage in the creative problem solving process. So, you know, if you were to create something that felt like a salon, people would know that that was a time to debate openly and have ideas and there would be an elevated level of trust in the room and openness. Whereas if you created something that was more like a review panel, you would create more um, um, re reservations in people. They wouldn't be willing to share their ideas as much. They would evaluate them in their heads before anything came out of their mouth because they didn't want to be criticized or evaluated right. wrong. You know what I mean? Whereas if you created a debate stage, now it becomes about winning. You know what I mean? It becomes about pointing your ideas out in a way that beats the other people's ideas. So those three are very different atmospheres. And so if you can create the right atmosphere, you almost don't need to create the the activity because the people will, will do it. So going back to evolution, I think all these behaviors are built into us. Our surrounding environment will tend to bring out some behaviors more than others. And right. we have to admit, all of us are so busy that we don't have time to say, let me sit around and come up with 12 ideas and then 
pick the one, right? right? That's why we don't do it. And what we need to do is we need to realize when is their time, when is it better to take a step backwards in terms of efficiency so that you can come up with something new and change your course? And when is it better to just kind of make a minor tweak or, or fix something slightly and move forward? So there's a time and a place for both, probably about 80% of the time I would go the efficiency route. The rest of the time I think people need to intentionally make the space to be more creative. So, I mean, from an evolutionary time scale, I mean, when we first stood up, and I posted this on, on LinkedIn not too long ago, uh, I, I posed the question because it was an article about um, there was mysterious DNA found in a couple of subjects, and they're not sure what branch of the human evolutionary tree that that DNA belongs to. And I, I posed the question, so which of our ancestors was the first to stand erect full time? Well, that that actually came about because of, to your point, the environment. They had to stand up for some reason. We don't know the reason. We can postulate what it is, but they had to stand up. So that was creative. Uh, but it had to happen on the spur of the moment. Now we're not, most of us are not under constant attack. We're not under that, that constant physical danger. So now it's evolved to more of, to your point, what am I going to do next? And you've experienced it. You talked about it just a few moments ago. You were creative with your own frustration with what you were doing. But can, and I've asked you this question in the prep uh, leading up to this, could you teach somebody to be Hemingway? Let's say they're a good writer, but could you teach them to be Hemingway or, you know, a, a fantastic painter, sculptor, whatever? Could you teach somebody to be that? Or do you think there's, that's not necessarily just creativity? I think you could. Okay. And, and I don't even know. I like that about, answer. I, I don't even think it's about teaching them. How many hours did Hemingway spend writing? How many pages did he write and then throw away? How many, you know, universes did he create in his mind, you know, that then he selected from and, and put down on paper for us to, to read about, you know what I mean? So I, I think anybody who has a genuine interest and is willing to put in the type of time commitment that Hemingway put in, um, I can't say they'll be as good, but some lot of that people will be better and some lot will be worse. You know what right. I mean? But you have to be willing to lead that path of, of doing that, that craft, you know what I mean? And, and so you're saying you have to put in the hard work. Yes, always. Yeah. <laughs> always. So I want to go back to something cause it, it, it spurred cause I don't want to harp on that. I'll get into lecture mode. If we, if we get on the hard work thing too long, um, <laughs> the climate, do you see social media, because you and I, again, because of conversations we had leading up to this, do you see social media as fomenting the climate that each of the platforms currently finds themselves in? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm not terribly active, um, but the reason I'm not active is because I don't find those environments satisfying or rewarding in any way because they're, they're echo chambers and they're people yelling at each other um, or they're, you know, they're, they're stuff um, that, that just kind of seems irrelevant to me. But actually where you would most likely find the most creativity in social media is probably in little niche areas. Um, like a group of people who all like to play the same video game or, um, or something where a group of people who, who have a genuine common interest have come together to really build on each other's ideas is probably where some of the most creative stuff is happening on social media. And that's not, um, that's not in the middle, you know what I mean? That's not, right. that doesn't stand out, you know, that's the part that kind of gets hidden in the, in the sides. So to that end, the, the climate is similar to your scientists. They have, every member of that group has essentially the same passion and are all looking toward one common objective, for yeah. lack of a better term. Yeah, so for the scientists, what's important? It, it's important that they all care about solving the same problem, right? So mm -hmm. if you 
bring together a group of people and you say, we're here to look at climate change or we're here to look at, um, you know, the role the microbiome plays in cancer or we're here to look at how do we get more one foot by one foot cube satellites up in atmosphere and what can we do with them and how can we make so if there's a common objective but then the people who come to the table come from very very different walks of life that is actually probably the prime ingredient where you're saying this person really understands how launch sequences go but this person really understands mobile devices and how much power you can get on this little thing mm -hmm. and that you know and you have all these people who have all these different expertises all towards the same objective and there's a little bit of friction into getting them to talk the same language but then once they do imagine that imagine you've been trying to solve some problem for the last 20 years and all of a sudden you just have access to so much more information and expertise than you ever did right you know I mean? it becomes almost a magical experience and, and breakthroughs just kind of start to take off exponentially so those are all those are sort of group settings a lot of the people who are going to be watching this video are watching it by themselves. They're not watching it as a group and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and they might not have that access to yeah. that supportive kind of environment. So if you're flying solo and you're telling them to do the 12 lists, that number 12 seems very daunting. Um, it would even, even to me, and I have lists way longer than 12. Um, so again, just general insights. What do you tell people like that who are by themselves or uh, and have to fly solo on these things? That's a great. That's another great question, Sean. And um, so many factors to unpack there. So, are they introverted or extroverted in nature? Meaning, do they generally enjoy and get energy from crowds and groups, or do they generally enjoy and get energy from being alone? Um, uh, and or and are they alone by choice or are they alone, you know, uh, because of the circumstances that we're, we're all in today. So if you're introverted and you're alone, that's a very different person that you're speaking to and a very different set of recommendations than if you're talking to an extrovert, you know what I mean? Somebody who, who literally can't process thought unless it's being said out loud. Right. You know what I mean? And so for, for that person, the recommendations would be, would be slightly different. Um, I, I'm an introvert. So for me, if you give me two or three hours by myself and like, I will, you know, that that's prime time for me to kind of go, what's going on in here and just go explore it and play with it and, um, and, and just figure it out. And, um, so what would my advice be to people? Well, first of all, it sounds like you got to figure out, do you need people or do you need to be alone? I mean, I, I didn't expect that to be your first comment to be honest with you but it, it makes sense yeah and if you need people and you don't have access to them what you do you do right, right. And, and so um there's a there's a really good activity um the the name is, is i think it's called virtual think tank or something like that so basically you pick like five or six characters and you just kind of ask the question from how would this person solve the problem um, so you pick Winnie the Pooh and Superman and Mikhail Gorbachev and you know, you just kind of pick some people and you kind of say, how would they solve this problem? And you get to kind of put yourself inside their head for a little while and you come up with a solution which probably doesn't work for you, but maybe has the thread of a unique idea that you right. can then say, oh, I could actually adopt that and make it, make it work for me. Um, so for an extrovert who's alone, I might suggest something like that and even potentially role playing it out loud, you know what I mean? Because it might help them and that might feel very silly, but you got to try it. And if it helps, keep doing it. And if it doesn't help then don't do it. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? right. so, um, what, what did you think my answer is going to be? I don't, I, 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 to be honest, I thought it, it was going to dovetail with what we had just talked about sort of climate and, and what are your objectives and then putting in the hard work. Do you put in the hard work? But the fact that you took something that one is incredibly relevant during, uh, well, was during the, the initial lockdown of 2020, and now is still relevant because not all the lockdown is sort of freely lifted, actually makes way more sense than what I was thinking about previously, which is why I don't teach creativity and you do. I think having an objective 
is an important factor. Um, and, and I think it leads to two very different types of creativity. There is the, I'm going to meander as I go. I have an hour, I'm gonna get some paint and I'm just going to go to a canvas and I'm just gonna see what comes out, right? And while mm -hmm. I'm doing this, I'm, I'm gonna think and let my mind wander and just kind of see what happens. And, and there is actually a lot of research around this, this activity called mind wandering and just literally putting yourself in a situation where you just kind of let your mind wander. And we all do this, right? When we do the dishes, when we take a shower, you know, and these are some of the best ideas people claim to come up with. Shower thoughts. Yeah, during this time of just kind of letting your mind wander, right? So um, there is one set of practice that says, well, even without an objective, if you just kind of let, put yourself in situations where your, your mind is allowed to wander, and that doesn't mean watching TV, that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, it means something meditative, something, you know, slightly stimulatory that, that really just lets your mind kind of take whichever avenues you want to go, but you need time. Or if you have a specific objective, if there's something you want to reach and you know that you need a novel answer for it, then you can actually get quite structured and you can say, okay, I'm going to gear towards this. So one, do I understand the problem well enough? Can I find an opportunity to rephrase and reframe the problem? Can I actually look at the problem from different angles to make sure that I'm solving it the way I want to solve it? Once you've looked at the problem a bunch of different ways and picked the handful that are the most useful, then you can actually start to generate ideas for how to solve it. And then once you generate a bunch of ideas, you can evaluate those and kind of narrow in on the most um, promising. Then you take some of those most promising ideas and you say, well, how might I actually make this happen? And then you get granular, right? Then you kind of say, well, what are the steps I would follow? And who are the people who support I need? And how do I get that support? And, and all of those things. And then you take action and you implement that. And um, of course, as soon as you take action, um, nothing turns out the way you thought it would turn out, right? And so um, that action in itself is a force of divergence, is a force of generating options. And then reality makes some choices for you, right? And so you gotta, you know, you gotta kind of keep that cycle going. So what I just described is, is called the creative problem solving process, clarification, ideation, development, and implementation. In reality though, it's much more cyclical and much more kind of all happening at the same time. You stop to reflect, you figure out where you are. As soon as you unlock yourself, you go right back into the action, making things happen, putting in the hard work. You know what I mean? And then when you feel stuck or you feel off course again, you go, wait, where am I? Has the problem changed? Has my idea changed? Like what's actually changed? You reevaluate and then you kind of get back to, back to work. But without action, ain't nothing gonna change, right? Uh, yeah, very <laughs> true. I, I, I think, well, it's, it's wishful thinking uh, is, is what it is. But, <laughs> It's actually very funny. We've kind of come back around from where we started, but in a very different frame because at the beginning of the conversation, you talked about the frustration you experienced with the corporate side because the structure was so constraining. And yet you just gave advice to people who want to take action on certain things that there is a structure to the creativity process itself. Um, and so I find that kind of, again, fascinating, which is why you're on this. One uh, of the recording. most successful things we did um, was, uh, was for a large corporation and they had, they wanted us to create a, a innovation training program, but that also led to real opportunities. And what we created was this tournament, if you will, we had, hmm. uh, about 120 people, we did two cohorts, 120 people each. They were, um, these were first time um, like managers. So they had a team, they had a set of direct reports, but they had just gotten them. So, so this is where they were in the, in the hierarchy. They were hypos, meaning that they were high potential employees. They were chosen because they, the corporation thought they had promised. And so what we did is we created this set of stage gates where you had to come up with a vision and recruit a team. And we had a, we had a class that we taught on how to do that, which was just maybe like an hour, 45 minutes or an hour. And then they had like a marketplace where they could meet people and exchange ideas and do that kind of stuff so that they could recruit a team around an idea. Once they had an idea, they had to go pitch it to a set of directors who were one level higher than they were. 
and they either got the green light from them or they got some useful feedback to go back to the drawing board and try again. And then they, if they made it through that stage, then they would make it to the second stage, which had to do with how do you make your idea actionable? Now that you have a promising vision, you know what I mean? How do you get tactical? How do you actually figure out how you're gonna implement this thing? Figure out what resources you need, you know what I mean? And, and kind of move forward. Then they had to pitch that to another group of, uh, of directors. Um, and, and sometimes the directors would get a little bit more senior too, as you went through the different stage gates. So after you figured out how we got tactical, then you figured out how to measure success. And then the last stage was figuring out how to de-risk something. And, um, and that was probably one of the most successful programs we ran. The company went on to run that with more senior people and they, it launched like, that's pretty much how they do innovation training and even innovation because the ROI on that, that they made their money back. Actually, one of the ideas that came up in that, and I'll, this will show you the breadth of the ideas. So at the end of that with 120 people, I remember that there were three ideas that the directors thought could potentially be billion dollar lines of business in and of themselves if they went wow. forward. And one of the ideas was simply a change in how they accounted for something, which allowed them to show like there, it was, this, was a, this was an innovation in the accounting space that was legal, that let them change <laughs> how they reported things, sure. which immediately resulted in, uh, in an increase in their revenue that was 10 times what they paid for the workshop. So in terms of kind of paper, you know what I mean, and stock prices sure. and things yeah. like that, like that was, that was 10x on their money immediately, you know what I mean, before the workshop was even over. And it just gets to show you the range of things. But what they did, right, is they took everybody out of their normal environment. They flew them all. Actually, this was in a foreign country. They flew them all to a foreign country. They put 100 of them together, and they created this whole other environment, this whole other atmosphere that let them kind of engage those things, challenge some of those norms. I bet when those ideas went back to the normal workplace, they met a lot of resistance. They met a lot of barriers. They met a lot of things. And that's going to happen. Right. right? The question is, in corporate America, who actually has the opportunity to be creative and who doesn't? And the truth is, if you're the head of marketing, you probably have quite a lot of opportunity to be creative. If you're, uh, you know, if you're the COO, you probably have, it's a different kind of creativity, but you probably have a lot of opportunity to be creative. If you're anybody reporting into those people, you probably have a lot of opportunity to be creative. But once you get further and further down where you just kind of go, here's the deliverable, here's the metric, please do your job, it gets harder and harder. Right which I guess is what frustrates people in corporate America yep. um, because they are so limited, which I guess also is a good, good sign for people if they can take that next step and get out of that and sort of pursue what they do want to do. Um, I did see somebody was complaining about their job. They work for a very large bank and whatnot. And, and I thought, and they were wondering when they could get out of of the bank and i said tomorrow you can, you can <laughs> hand in your resignation tomorrow uh, and they're like oh no i can't do that because I, I wouldn't in this environment i can't find another job and and i got bills to pay and whatnot well immediately they had the idea but they just they wanted to wish it away instead of if they're watching this video hopefully then they start sitting down and doing their their 12 ideas so I want to use this as an opportunity to talk about a gentleman named Michael Curtin. And he created something called the Curtin Adapter Innovator Scale. And here was his premise that creativity is not just big, massive changes. Sometimes creativity really is tiny little tweaks. And he called that adaptive creativity. And then the other kind of creativity, which is the big change, he called that innovative creativity. So not to pass any judgment, these are just words. So it's a spectrum from adaptive to innovative. There's nothing better about innovative than there is about adaptive. And everybody has, is more comfortable with change at a particular level on that spectrum. Some people, you hand them a problem, and what they want to do is they immediately want to go throw it out and start from a blank slate. And some people, you hand them a problem, they go, no, nah, I really just want to understand it. Okay, that's what's wrong. Let me fix that little thing. Right. Both of those things are really creative. They're just creative in different ways. And so what, what was done with this scale that he developed is, um, is he went out and interviewed a lot of people and they took the assessment. 
And then he looked at what they did for a living and how satisfied they were. And he found that there were correlations between where you were on this band and how happy you were at work. And so, for example, if you were between a 95 and a 105, and I, don't quote me on the numbers here, yeah. and you were in marketing, probably you really liked what you did. If you were between 65 and 85, and you were you know, in something that was um, very focused on little minor tweaks, um, or, you know, that you were really happy at what you did. You know what I mean? Or, you know, and so you could be anywhere across the spectrum and um, coding software is something to look at, right? Because, oh, yeah. you know, like people who really enjoy like um, hacking, probably, you know, a nice blend of being able to kind of go into that adaptive space, but then totally break through with something over versus, you know, people who, who do more user experience Actually, it's really hard to say. Some people who do user experience are probably very adaptive, and some people who do user experience are rather comfortable in the innovative realm. So, so it just goes to show that, that there's different types of creativity. And so the people who are unhappy in corporate America is probably because there's a far greater number of need, there's a far larger need for people in that ad adaptive zone. Right. And really the population isn't all there. The population is far more spread out. So it's about finding that job that lets you be creative in the way that you want to be creative. So when you were doing corporate or even the scientists, did you bring up that scale? Is there a test that sort of determines where you are on that scale? Yeah, you can do the curtain adapter innovator scale. Um, and there's also another one called um, the change style indicator, which is kind of like a, a, a a simpler version of curtains. If you can get access to curtains, I would do curtains in a heartbeat. You know how you take those surveys and every time you're just kind of like, ah. Yeah. I, I love that survey because the very last question on the survey was, how much did you enjoy taking this survey? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, great. I was like, I was like, not at all, but now because you asked that, I have to at least mark it one higher. Yeah. Yep. So you were a one on my scale, really, but I'm going to give you a three just because I don't want you to feel so bad or make me look like a jackass uh, for saying it. But to all, to be fair, though, you finished the survey. Yeah. I mean, you got to the last question. So yeah, as yes, painful as it might have been, you still got to the last question. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So this is, I, I mean, we could keep going on. We're at 35 minutes at this point. So I'm going to, I'm going to close it out because one of the things it, that you've really been, and that, that, that scale that you talked about, the adaptive and the innovative, I think is the clear message that I really wanted to get across. Cause again, we have talked about this before is that creativity does not have to be something so big and bold. Creativity could be how you readjust your schedule so you can get your kids from A to B to C to Z much more efficiently or with less headache for yourself. Parents are now stuck at home with their kids, maybe for a long time um, or at least another few months if schools don't open. So creativity is not necessarily write, writing the great American novel or painting something magnificent. Creativity could be, how do I get my work done while still making sure my kids are getting the remote education that they need to get. Yeah. yeah. And, and how do I find the time and space to nurture that need inside of me to create something new, to, 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 to change the world in my world in some, in some little form. Um, I think when talking about creativity, it's also important to talk about happiness because so many times, creativity is a vehicle towards trying to be happier, right? Towards trying to reach something that you want or some state. And, and, and I like to say that happiness is an approach, not a destination. Happiness is not something that you become. And I'm not the only one who says something like this, right? Happiness is not something you become once you get everything you want. Mm -hmm. Happiness is the way you go about getting the things you want. And creativity can be such a valuable tool in that approach, in that journey that you take. And, and anybody and everybody should find ways to bring it in, whether it's deliberately to try to get closer to some goal or try to achieve something, or whether it's more you know, tacit and it's about just creating that hour for yourself to, to read a book and see what it makes you think or 
grab a canvas and, and paint something or grab a math problem that, you know, that used to be really fun to solve when, you know, mm -hmm. if you were one of those people who liked solving algebra equations, you know what I mean? That's very creative as well. So. Well, you, um, you were one of the people that helped spur a habit that I've formed uh, during the workday in that I set a, a I, I try to set my schedule so that I have about 10 minutes every hour, hour and a half, two hours at max to where during that 10 minutes, I go read something right. or multiple things that may be out totally far flung from what I do for work, a la the, the mysterious DNA uh, mm -hmm. in, in those samples, uh, simply because it, it helps me reset my brain. Uh, I get such in, in the zone that I, stop, I forget what I'm actually working on or what I'm trying to achieve or if there's a better way to do it if I'm constantly in the weeds. So I've got to come out and I've got to yeah. see the swamp as opposed to just the weeds. And that's what I've decided to do. And actually, if you helped spurt it a, a couple years ago and then some other things that I read, that if take what you enjoy and do it for 10 minutes, but restrict yourself to that 10 minutes. And then you look forward to it, but you refresh yourself and you can start up again. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, and, and what have you done in that 10 minutes is you've taken yourself out of your normal routine, out of that pattern where you're, you know, you're just kind of in that rut and you've filled your brain with potential ideas and inspiration and right. like they work their way into this conversation, I bet they work their way into all kinds of conversations, right? So by default, that's going to lead you to a very different day than if you hadn't done that. If you hadn't done that, you would have you would have had a very straightforward day. You know what I mean? Right. But by actually creating ten minutes for a little inspiration, a little bit of mind wandering, a little bit of something, you you're influencing where your day's going to end up. And and really, it's about serendipity at that point, isn't it? Because oh yeah, you're just adding a little randomness to the equation, right. and you see where where it pans out. And I kind of I kind of enjoy that now. In fact, I I, I will say this, and then I'll let you close out uh, with final thoughts. In that. COVID has actually been more beneficial for that because I'm not constantly out of the office, <clears throat> excuse me, meeting people or having to go to a client site or a prospect site because they want to meet in person. So we do it this way, which saves on the, the commute time, which gives me more time to actually do those 10 minutes hmm. uh, than on a, on a normal daily or weekly schedule. So. So um, I had the exact opposite experience, not because of COVID, because I, I don't, um, I can't say that I was very affected because I work from home, um, yeah. other than when I would go on an airplane to travel to clients, right? So the most of, most of my back and forth was from home. But when that happened, I stopped commuting. And my commute used to be either uh, when I lived in New York on the subway or, or later on in the car. And that was my time to listen to podcasts, to read books, to do all those things, which I now working from home, find it very hard to make time for any of those things. Yes. Spot on. Yeah. Uh, you and I are the, in the exact so same boat. I might need to take your approach of saying, I can't, I don't commute anymore. So here it is on the side. This is my three activities for my 10 minute breaks or my 15 minute breaks. And, and do you know what? Boom, creativity. I don't know why I don't do that as part of the 10 minutes. I've gotten so ingrained in the process of reading something as opposed to just throwing the headphones on and hit and play for 10 minutes and then taking it off and going back. It's the exact same experience. It's just not visual for me. It's, it's, it's audible. So uh, there you go. This conversation was well worth it just to, to spur that thought in me. I keep a calendar invite and, and it's just kind of recurring. And anytime I come across a podcast or something that I want to, I just cut and paste it and throw it in there. And the list is much longer than I'll ever get to. But if right. I did adopt what you're saying about these 15 minutes, I have a long kind of list of things to, <laughs> to fill it with. So that would be fantastic. I think we both got something valuable. Hopefully the listeners got something valuable. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for. If they didn't, well, then we just had a really good conversation that happened to be recorded. So, you know, there is that. Hey, this was fantastic. We, we blew through 40 minutes and we could keep going because you brought up other topics and other questions that I want to have answered, but we'll save that for round two. Uh, I really want to thank you.
uh, Stavros, even though I don't physically see you anymore because of our geographic locations, <laughs> it's, uh, we'll make sure that we keep doing this on a regular basis. And I want to thank everybody for stopping in. I uh, hope you enjoyed the conversation, however long it might have taken you to listen to this in 10 minute increments. Maybe you do 15, uh, or maybe you still commute and you can listen to this during your whole commute. But I really want to thank you. Stavros's company's um, URL is in the notes section. Feel free to visit it. Feel free to reach out to them if it's something that you want you to do for your company for your employees, which I think it'd be well worth your time to explore that. Uh, any final thoughts before we sign off and I hit the stop button on the record? There's always more thoughts than there is time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you for everyone for listening. Um, I hope this was valuable to, to some folks and inspirational in some way. And um, I'm always curious to, to learn from people and hear from people about their, their experiences and struggles, business related or not. So um, if you look through there and my LinkedIn is in there, please reach out, ask questions. I enjoy these kinds of conversations. Fantastic. It will definitely be in there. Okay, everybody, until next time, same to you, Stavros. Until next time, I'm Sean O'Rourke signing off and ignore me while I look down and hit the stop button. See ya.